Welcome to Open Source Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name is Arvon. And I'm Abby. We're your hosts. Every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, Just. This is episode 11, and today we're chatting with Fred Schoen about their paper, PAM, Population Activity Modeler. I thought this was really fun. This is a super yeah, fun well, conversation. And I liked the origin story, how this was originally the pandemic activity modifier, and now it's population sorry. activity modeler, and they kept the acronym. Yes. But yeah, there was a need to understand people's activities when the lockdowns hit, so. Yeah, this was one of those things where you could have wished that, that you had time to really dig in for a subject area. I just think this idea of modeling behavior, especially when it's trying to affect policy decisions and business mm-hmm. decisions, it just seems really interesting with space. And it seemed actually like Fred's background was what, engineer to economist, the data scientist to now a PhD student. It seems like a combination of things that he knew from his career. He and that group were really well positioned to write these tools. Yeah. I actually haven't looked at the code in depth on this one, but it seemed like a really interesting problem technically to work in. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to hear him talk about it. Yeah. Well, should we play the interview? Let's do it. Welcome to the show, Fred. Thank you. Uh, Fred, uh, why don't you start off by telling us whereabouts you work, what kind of stuff you work on? I think you had a change in role since you started working on this software. So if you want to catch us up, that would be cool. Sure. I'm a PhD student at the moment, or almost one year in. But Pam originally is a software written while I was at a company called Arup, and it's still supported by Arup. And Arup are a, an engineering consultancy originally. So I think civil engineering, think like bridges and stuff. But also they'll do, typically of consultants, they'll do anything that they're asked to do. We do a little bit of software dev as well. Cool. Yeah, cool. looking at the bio that you sent over, you have this line there. It says, originally a civil engineer, then an economist, then a data scientist. And now you're sure. studying at the Behavior and Infrastructure Group, I believe. Can yeah. you tell us a bit about that journey? It's pretty unique. And how did you get this interest in behavioral models? Sure. So I'm, uh, I am getting kind of old, so it's starting to become a long, boring story. I, I actually, I have met someone else who's made the same progression oh. or, or, or regression. Civil engineering is, was like, I guess, almost like the family business. And I did that for quite a long time. And, and, I, and I used to love the, the technical work. But actually, after a while, you find out that it's about practicalities. So you, you'd hope that when you're designing something, like a big bridge, that it, you were like trying to stop it from falling down. But actually, you kind of, you end up designing the paint job. You still have to worry about like corrosion and long-term problems and like accessibility. So I guess I got a little bit, a little bit bored. So I moved on to economics, which for a while I thought was like the engineering of people, which sounds a little bit dystopian, I guess, but I, found, I, lo- I loved economics until we got up to macro and like 2000, yeah, like financial sort of collapse stuff. And then it turned out economics was, it was wrong. And I started to pick up software tools basically. And, and from then, I guess I, I think I'm moving towards software engineering. And data science is like a happy medium in the middle. And then specifically behavior models is just, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think it's a domain that has like a lot of low hanging fruit in research. It's a little bit 1970s, the maths, and it's probably quite trivial. I mean, that's just some people. Uh, yeah. And it's like a lot of progress that can, uh, can be made. And also, it's like, I guess there's a clear application, like for, 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 for changing policy and infrastructure decision, which, which I like. So think like planning high-speed rail or in London at the moment, it's like low traffic neighborhoods. So, Can you tell us, I mean, we've all had a journey his professionally, right? We've all got the thing you thought you were going to be when you grow up. And I'm still looking at other people's careers and wondering if I should have done that. So I don't know. The story gets longer as you get older, right? Well, good luck with your PhD anyway. That sounds, that sounds exciting. I was going to say, could you tell us about this project, PAM? Nice acronym, Population Activity Modeler. What's the... What's, what kind of problems are you solving in this project? And sort of tell us a little bit about the sort of genesis of the project and, and why it starts. Sure, sure. So, so the genesis is what I think, I think is a nice story. It actually originally was the um, pandemic activity modifier. And we, we built it like in a real rush at the start of COVID. We had, this is at Arik, we had some, some, some clients who basically needed to update their transport models. So it's like, uh, they have this model of the world like running 
trains and, 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 and so on, buses. And then uh, suddenly everyone started behaving very differently. So we wanted to come up with a way of very rapidly updating the models. And so Pam originally, so we kept the name Pam, but like grew from that original tool that's sort of successful and useful. And it kind of provides like an underlying library or API for then building a lot of other stuff, basically, which is what it's used for today. And was there, so obviously like, I think COVID affected pretty much everyone's lives, some more and more substantially than others, of course. Is it like the companies Arab were working with needed to know like whether they needed a bus service anymore or whether they need more capacity? Like what were the sort of business problems that they were actually trying to so with this yeah, modeling that you were doing? Consulting question. Yeah, I think, I mean, very specifically, one of the questions was like, will things be safer, sort of, sort of epidemiology? I'm not sure I can pronounce it, but in terms of virus transmission, will things right. be safer if we run like less public transit and so discourage people from using it or if we run more and then people are more spread out. So it's just like very, it's, it's like an interesting place just in general behavior modeling because you've got like, you've got some sort of simulation or, or, or modeling that you understand quite well, which is like how fast it takes to get from A to B. And but then you also got humans in the mix as well. And so you get this like very, uh, chaotic or complicated mechanisms and so, so yeah those these sorts of questions that's what we were originally answering so um, something was actually very nuts and bolts so it's like we understand that at the moment from statistics five percent of people are quarantining and then the question is like given that we know that what should now the demand for travel look like and, and ironically so I, I think i said earlier transport or behavior modeling was a bit 1970s and one of the implications of that is that they don't really have people in them they have like these kind of abstractions of of people moving or of movement from like area to area and so what pam does is actually quite simply put people back in and so then you can apply these like yeah you can apply these updates more sensibly or it's like it's a nicer abstraction to work with so you say like oh, okay 50 percent of people like this are going to now be at home or these people are, are now like behaving differently and you can apply those rules or policies. So it's, yeah, if, if I had to like do a one liner, I'd just say Pam is a, it's just like a nice abstraction of the world basically. That makes sense. And good job keeping the acronym from pandemic activity <laughs> modifiers, <laughs> population activity Nate. modeler. It worked really well. Thank you. But I did yeah, want to ask, so you. I think I remember reading this in the paper. So you used, I can't remember what's phrase, it was like agent modeler. So you're actually modeling the specific people that are in this, in this system. Can you talk a little bit more about that and why that's a better way to do this? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's like a philosophical argument going on in like the industry and in academia about that. A lot of it centers around equity. So it's like, if you don't have people, it's a lot harder to, to sort of measure the impact or the fairness of what you're modeling. And so one of the nice things where you have people is you can say, you can define the people very explicitly. So like, this is, an old person or a wealthy person or, or, or an old wealthy person and so on. Or this person has to, yeah, has like a young child say, or they have to do a heavy shop. Without kind of this representation of people, having the proper mechanisms in your model to deal with these people, I mean, it doesn't happen. So yeah, like Pam hopefully provides people with that abstraction and lets them model these concerns correctly, let's say. Yeah. And and a nice like consequence is also just like mechanically a lot of the modeling you then do is sort of um, it's more pragmatic maybe or it's easier to understand so the accessibility to like the the, the tooling is actually quite low I think it's one of the reasons for the project success is that people can like look into the code base and, and it's it, it it's kind of makes sense I think there's a proper software engineering word for it but basically yeah like the objects are meaningful it's quite easy to understand what's going on. Yeah, transparency yeah. or, was, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, it does, I mean, it does sort of sound like one of the things I always thought was kind of interesting about, like, object-oriented programming, and promise I'm not about to go on a big deep dive here, but <laughs> on, on object-oriented design is, is that objects quite often represent things in the real world. So, like, you know, the, and, that, and that to me makes a ton of sense. So when you're just, so this difference between sort of just writing a script that solves a problem, sort of brute force, sort of analytical problem versus stopping and saying, hang on, what is it that we're trying to think about? Oh, there are people and maybe we can represent them with like attributes and behavior, oh, characteristics that you could then use to infer behaviors or stuff. So it, 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 this sort of agent, as you said, sort of putting the people back into these models, like intuitively feels 
both appropriate yeah. and like maybe a, even a better way to answer the questions. Is that fair? Yeah, there's a trade-off, right? Because sometimes be inefficient. Okay. And, and I guess I mean I'm, I'm I'm sure that this is the reason why it hasn't been standard practice for the last fifty years because the computers were you couldn't handle it necessarily. But now it's much more it's much more approachable. And I think there's sometimes an obsession with, say, like runtimes or, well, particularly like for memory footprint now, like computers just have a lot of memory. It's less of a concern. But then like um, for runtimes, sometimes we like, yeah, we worry too much about the, 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 how long the process is to take to run and, and not worry enough about how long it takes someone to actually get them running. And so Pam is like, and this is great in a consultancy environment, obviously, like people could come in, like a lot of people that come in, got it running. So that's super quick. So it's fast in a very kind of like meta way. This idea of agents sort of actually reminds me a bit of econ, like modeling people and their behaviors. And, you know, maybe they sort of have preferences about what the, the things they might do. Is this where the good sort of combination of your like economic brain with your sort of just the, what you learn? Yeah, I, I is, this, so. is, this, yeah, yeah. is this like how you think about the world and more generally? Yeah, I think I, I think it's not this so it's not like novel this idea that good people are different. Sure. Because, <laughs> yeah, but, right. But but like the, a lot of the, the a lot of the maths, yeah, like so this field dominates like discrete choice modeling. So it says like the world must be, like your choices must be you must have a finite choice set. It must be like well defined. We must be able to understand all the alternatives. It's just like we look at a person <clears throat> and we try to decide whether they're gonna catch the bus or catch the train or, or drive their car. And, and this is how it's been for, for about 50 years. And, and, and to their credit, this domain has tried to like bring in more, more information about the person making the decision. And obviously there's a lot more data kicking around nowadays. But what, what Pam does is say, well, actually, not only do we want to add complexity to that kind of that single choice, but it says that all those choices that you make during the day actually should also influence each other. So it's like, if I make a decision in the morning about how I'm going to travel, this also going to affect a decision later on. I mean, a simple one is like, if you drive to work, you, you should probably drive back again, otherwise you've lost your car. Or, or, or and maybe the opposite for going to the pub, like I say, like probably shouldn't drive to the pub. And, and then, so that's like within a person's kind of like domain. And then there's also this idea then that people should also interact with each other. And then a really obvious one that is very hard to do is within a household, if people are sharing a car or that you have children have to be escorted. And this is, this turns out to be very difficult. And then when you get like really broad and you want to run a simulation of a city with like a million people in and they're all bouncing into each other. Yeah, this is like the stuff that Pam wants to be used for and also the stuff I want to do for my PhD. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Are you studying similar work or you know, like extending this research now in your PhD studies? Yeah, yeah. And was this and, like and the introduction to it and now you're doing it more or? Yeah, Yeah, in many ways yeah, I, I progressed Yeah, from Pam to yeah, into, into research. I, so I kind of alluded to it, like a lot of the problems now, so we've like increased the complexity of these models. And now we have to worry about the, the, like, yeah, solving them, so to speak. And so like a lot of the work I'm doing now, I, I, I'm, I'm using, been using PAM last week, just in like a simple task, which is like very pleasant, something that would otherwise have taken like a week, just pulling data from one format into another. I'm training some uh, generative models to kind of like, yeah to sort of try and look like reality, if that makes sense. And, 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 and so it's like, a, so I like off on a tangent. Uh, the first point is that BAM is useful, at least to me still, uh, almost five years later. And yeah, the second point is, yeah, like it's still, it's, I'm, I'm using it for my PhD. It's like for the foundation, like theoretically, and also now, yeah, practically as well for a lot of work. Cool. So you can thank Pam for inspiring this research interest, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, we, you mentioned a little bit about like buses and earlier on and uh, some of the use cases, but is there a, is there a typical sort of target audience for this, this kind of analysis or for Pam in particular, like what are the people who are most interested in understanding these problems? Transport sounds like one, are there other domains? Yeah. Anyone who's engaged in activity based modeling or, or perhaps agents like agent based modeling where the agents are or are people like it should be, should be should be of interest and, and like the the domains are uh, yeah typically transport but also energy uh, and then for a, yeah for a while it was all epidemiology so it's just like trying to decide or trying to understand where people are going to be and what they're going to be doing and, and like where so any any kind of domain that's interested in that 
So it's for energy, it's like maybe most simply, like when are you going to turn on your heating or kettle? Like when are you going to get home? For transport, obviously, it's people moving from A to B. And then for epidemiology, it's yeah, people spending time together at, at buildings or, or on the bus and so on. I'm sure there are broader applications. And actually, the current one that's got good interest is an electric vehicle rollout, which is like a combination of transport and uh, energy. And obviously, humans are there in the mix, like making decisions and so yeah. create some interesting models. Yeah, I think I saw now that you're interested in, like, how are you going to charge all these batteries if as the electric cars roll out? Which I wonder sometimes, because where I live in Toronto, we don't all have parking spaces. Yeah, yeah, same street yeah, parking. Yeah. It's like, how do you... Yeah, anyways. I mean, going back to, the, like, the fairness issue, it's a big deal, right? So it's yeah. not only will it work, it's, it's also like, okay, we made it work, but was it fair? And, and yeah, places like London, where a lot of people don't have access to off-street charging it's going to be mm-hmm. it's going to be pretty chaotic and a little bit on the audience still so arab would arab use pam to answer clients questions or would the clients themselves often use pam how how did that work right so certainly now it's like a very established uh, internal tool which actually i think is kind of a big deal for a consultancy it's not it's not like a typical consultancy my experience with consultancy is they're very happy to solve a question you know, multiple times, uh, and it's, yeah. it's, they're certainly not like software development houses. And and so, like, what my team does, it was the this is kind of a shout out to the to the city modeling lab. We 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 sort of formed a, a team that was doing client work, and at the same time making the software and, and keeping the software on the side. And and open source was kind of like the, I guess, the recipe for doing that in that environment. But originally, we did it for our, for ourselves. But you have to imagine like a consultancy is quite like a large group of people and you have your own team, but then there are obviously a lot of other teams. And so you're kind of like opening up firstly for yourselves and then you're opening up for the teams internally. And then since then we've had like external people use it as well. I wouldn't necessarily say that clients were using it. I think otherwise they wouldn't be paying someone else to do work in the first time. Yeah, yeah. But maybe in the future. I mean, nothing's stopping them. And I guess related to that, when I was looking at the repository, I saw there's quite a few contributors. I think it was 29. Or, wait, I wrote it down in our notes. But quite a lot for a pretty specialized piece of scientific software. Yeah, I, yeah. Do you think that's mostly like the internal Arab group and the, how they develop? Or is there actually external people that have started contributing? So, so the, there are... There's a, there's a small core that I was, that were like, in fact, can I do sh- shout outs to yeah, a couple yeah, of people? Please, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course. So very early on, Kasha worked alongside me. And then Theo, who's sadly my Canuck con- Prowls. And then very recently, Bryn Pickering has brought the project up to modern standard. So that's just like that, some core group. And then a lot of the contributors are actually our sort of colleagues, but I wouldn't necessarily say they were part of that core group. So it, I, I often think of them as... Yeah, as, as sort of um, paid open source contributors. But but then on top of that, there are some external guys. And actually, a shout out to uh, GitHub, the user called Chicken Teriyaki Cup Rice, who very early on, unsolicited, made a, a one-line change that fixed an issue. Yeah. But, I love Chicken yeah, Teriyaki. It's certainly yeah. is. It's a great yeah, username. I, uh, yeah, great handle. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, definitely, it's not like, there are a lot of people, but yeah, like I say, they're close, close to the team. But yes, I'm external. We also had a lot of PhDs who used the project to like help them with their with their work. Who mm. have like provided a lot of feedback. So not necessarily making code changes, but tell us where things are hard to use or or, or broken. And now you're the PhD providing feedback. I'm yeah. providing feedback to myself. Yeah. <laughs> this kind of raises a question about the sort of what's the sort of state of open source software in in the sort of area you operate in. Is it is it the sort of de facto standard? Is everyone happy to open issues on repos and sling code around or is yeah, it, yeah. is it, is it, no, um, no. what's it look like? It's a really good, it's a really good question. I actually, one that's quite, I think, important to, to, to me and, 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 and yeah, my former team, because it's like quite difficult to, to publish open source from a, yeah, from, I guess from industry, it's, it's quite hard to make the case for it. And publishing in, in Joss, for example, it's like a nice way of kind of yeah, like defending some of those decisions like a while ago uh, to sort of lose lose IP, lose intellectual property uh, potentially. 
but I, I could talk a little bit about like how we made the case for it. So I, th- I, th- yeah, I think please. it is. That would be so great. yeah, so like it's it's certainly not like common practice for yeah. I think for industry like consultancy to to make and then share software, it like almost goes against <laughs> <laughs> goes against all them. Yeah, everything to their core. Yeah, but uh, so so two things were sort of well the the team I was in this the city modeling and team were were like set up originally as kind of like supposed to be let's say a beacon of, of good software engineering within within the consultancy. So I think a lot of consultancies understand they want to be better at software, and and, and quite early on we just established sort of what I guess for most people listening are like very seem like very obvious like open source sort of standards and we just adopted those as our team's sort of quality standards but not necessarily and that's just for our own benefit so we make the case that this this is gonna well, this is gonna allow us to produce software that is reusable by ourselves and teams around us and hopefully in five years time by completely new teams and this, these standards are going to make the software uh, reusable and so that like initial investment of time is going to be worthwhile and there is like for sure that like, you have to go through that kind of like overhead to i guess everyone knows this. you have to do a bit of work right little sort of yeah quite a lot of overhead work to make sure that you could reuse even your own stuff in the future never mind like new people but like so we so we try to make this yeah we made this case successfully i think we also like talked a lot about how sharing it externally was quite good it's good for the reputation of sort of, the company uh and it helps with things like yeah it helps even maybe with recruitment to have some kind of right. like open right. open yeah representation I, I, I'm not sure if I answered that question. Or not. No, no, no that's I, think, great. I think you did. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, I think, I was going to say, I think many companies that are sort of solving hard technical problems, that I think increasingly there's the, a, a good collection of arguments for publishing open source software. Recruitment is one that comes up a lot. I think people have sort of realized that many of the highest value potential future employees are very motivated by open source and publishing their work and sharing. And so, you know, it's actually a, an incredible attractor for, for talent. And then there's also, I mean, there's other companies going even pushing even further with like a really deliberate open source strategy, but it's, it's a it's often, I think recruitment is quite a big, a big, a big motivator. And just, this is a smarter way to work. And, and then nice reasons like principled reasons, like we should share this. Yeah. Yeah. Those often aren't the business yeah. winning arguments. There's a, those are usually like the, oh, and also this is great for our reputation. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, for recruitment, chicken teriyaki, you better watch out there on GitHub. Yes. Or might be call any yeah. soon. Might be in your <laughs> inbox right now. But with a lot of industry, I know um, a lot of groups have an open source program office or an OSPO that really manages, like helps people release things internally to become open source and like owns that process of making things open. It sounds like at Arup, you were, it was just like, we want to make this open. You're really spearheading that. I, I mean, I guess that's the story I'm going to tell. I, perhaps I, I would say this is probably maybe a unique challenge of consultancies in that they are not so much like easy of organization sometimes they could be quite like siloed or yes separated uh, arab i actually can't recommend it enough <laughs> as a place to work but yeah it's not my impression of consultancies that they are i, I mean we have like google or, or team mind like publishing these like hugely useful projects sort of like foundational to to, to everything that's but particularly in yeah in ai but yeah i don't think consultancy necessarily have a good track record and actually my yeah i think when they tend to make software they tend to they tend to make people pay for it but yeah there's i hope we've like made the case only within arab and then and now also more broadly that, that it can be like yeah it can be like efficient sort of commercially as well as as well as like yeah agreeing with people sort of philosophically to actually do this kind of medium-sized software that, that in the middle that yeah is is correct for many reasons to do it in an open source manner. Yeah. yeah. For consultancies that do release things openly, in the web development space, I think Boku has done a lot and they've written a lot of like web development tooling that's okay. adopted yeah. now because of that. But I agree with you. Most consultancies not don't don't quite do it. But if you're looking for a model on how to do this yeah, okay. well, I'm actually not sure what Boku's up to now, but that's an option. Hopefully they're not out of business, yeah. <laughs> 
should probably say, have been I mean, a- actually, as I was looking at Arab's uh, GitHub profile, there was like 160 odd public repos, which is so. This is not just a one off, like, it's clearly no, uh, so, number of uh, things. Yeah, I, and I think, I think, yeah, so I, I mean, I, there are other people within Arab that I maybe have never met that are also, also spear, yeah, would also describe themselves as spearheading open source. Yeah, I, there are, I should say, there are, if you're, if you've, if people find PAM interesting or, or useful, and there are a bunch of other projects, particularly by the city modeling lab. So if you follow the GitHub tags, you'll find other projects that are yeah. also doing activity based modeling. And had you done much open source um, before this, especially to be able to advocate so well for opening PAM? No, no, I guess not, no. Not much. We we brought in, I guess, one or two sort of more official software engineers very early on, and, and they were very instrumental in like getting people to understand what they're doing. But now I'm like, I guess, I'm a relatively young software engineer, and therefore, yeah, certainly a very young open source uh, engineer. Although I'm not actually very young. So I was going to ask, what's next for this project? I mean, obviously, it sounds like you're still using the tool. Maybe you're still contributing and um, maintaining in some way. But like, are there are there obvious sort of areas you want to take take the project? Like, is it bigger? Like, are there new computational methods you could employ to solve bigger problems? Like, I was just curious, what's next in this software space? Yeah. So for me personally, I. I certainly more interested in using it what it already has at the moment but there are some people working on so there's a big contribution coming soon for uh, like generative models within within the PAM framework so like you can train a model to to generate a new sort of a sort of synthetic or safe sort of like population of people and, and yeah it's more broadly you think of PAM originally as being like a, a library or underlying API people are building things like on top of it and actually there's going to, there's going to probably be like some schism or, or problem in the future where people, yeah, with their project scope starts to get quite big. And so maybe there'll be some, some friendly arguments and, and maybe that will be, maybe that's a good reason to contribute, be an entertaining project. There's like, so I think, yeah, the, the, the scope of PAM will, will for sure like creep a little bit and we'll be like looking to manage, like make sure it remains sort of accessible and documented and easy to use. There were some like grumblings about sort of, yeah, like thinking about how the, like the underlying kind of abstraction might be made sort of smaller or faster. And so maybe there will be like a heavy rewrite of like core stuff in, in the future. But yeah, I guess I encourage people to just check out the issues. Yeah. Yeah. It Very sounds good. like any open source project. It's funny. All, all projects have those uh, discussions, but it's open source where you see it openly. <laughs> That's that yeah. entertainment yeah, yeah, sure. factor sometimes. Yeah. And if someone does want to jump in and contribute, uh, what's the best way for them to start doing that? So, yeah. So, so we have issues, uh, issues register and we have like contribution guidelines. I think we're like a very well set up project to take kind of input. I think like, as you said earlier, we we are quite niche, although I imagine a lot of research software, software is. So, so, so yeah, I mean. I think of it as there being like three kind of criteria, like so someone having good sort of good Python, good understanding of of contributing to open source, and then also domain experience. And, and as long as you have maybe like two out of those three, then the team will help you help anyone out with the, the third one. We like contribution, and, and we're happy also just to get like feedback about the yeah, F problems. <laughs> All right. So I was going to say, and more generally, what's the way that people can keep up with your work online? Is there any particular places people can follow your work or you that you would like to people to follow you or can also say no? Uh, <laughs> I, I would love for people to certainly take a look at, to take a look at Pam and, and that's probably GitHub is probably the easiest way to, to find me. My, yeah, my username is Fred Shane. Um, I also it's not have chicken a, teriyaki. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's I think is you. <laughs> I started a website, so I think I'll be Fred Shown at GitHub.io, and it'd be cool if people will take a look at that. Mostly empty space, but yeah, very happy for people to get in touch with me. And, and more broadly, the 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 city modeling lab, the team I was a part of, are also like nice, approachable group of people. So if like particularly if the domain is of interest, like there's a lot of time people have. For you if you want to get in touch 
All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today and telling us about Pam. Fred, I wish you best of luck with your PhD and I hope that goes well Thank for you. you. And thanks again for being part of the podcast. No problem. Thank you. Yes, it's fun. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arkin Smith and me, Abby Kubunak-Mace. Edited by Abby and music CC by Fox